There are some veteran wisdom I learned way too late, and to ensure that same thing doesn't happen to you, I'm sharing these choice cuts next. I'm Mike Quackenbush, and this is Till We Make It. Right here on my channel, I make videos for fellow professional wrestlers at every single stage of their career. And I do it because when I was starting out, I didn't have a coach to teach me, nor did I have a mentor to guide me. And not having access to veteran wisdom, knowledge, and experience when I needed it the most during my apprentice phase, it played a significant role in my failure to achieve my ultimate career goal. And I don't want that to happen to you. This theme resonates really powerfully through today's content here on Till We Make It. If you're not yet a member of the Till We Make It tribe, well, go on. Subscribe down below and enable notifications so you never miss out. Or take your support of the Till We Make It project to the next level by joining us over on Patreon. I just posted up nearly an hour of footage from my recent submission hold seminar just for my patrons. In addition to which, there's well over 50 exclusive videos there, plus book excerpts, podcasts, and tons more that you'll never find here on the YouTube channel. You can get access to our private Discord and become part of our community for as little as five bucks. Today, I want to share with you some nuggets of veteran wisdom that I wish I had heard much earlier in my career. I would have really benefit from knowing this kind of stuff. And just to rewind for a second, you probably know at the top of a lot of Till We Make It's, I mentioned the fact that I went the first three years of my career without a coach, without a mentor. But that is not to say that I've gone decades upon decades without benefiting from the mentorship of some really talented, experienced, seasoned pros out there. I wouldn't be standing here today if it weren't for the mentorship of Ace Darling. I would have tumbled cluelessly into the world of promoting and booking wrestling if it weren't for the advice of Mike Burns. And I never would have evolved into the master of a thousand holds if it weren't for Jorge Rivera, the Mexican luchador who wrestles under the name Skyda. But the things I'm going to share with you today, even if I heard this one from Ace or I heard this one from Burns or whomever, have become part of a communal treasure chest of information within professional wrestling that really needs to be handed down to the next generation. And that's why I want to make sure I share each of these valuable bits with you. So this is the one I want to lead with because I think it's the most powerful. You can't get over by yourself. In a match, you must work to get your opponent over and your opponent must work to get you over. And together, that creates a match which gets over with the audience. You can't go out there and do it all on your own and expect to be successful. Or another way of looking at that is, you can't be a selfish performer. You must go to the ring in service to the person you are performing with. Thinking about that, we can flip the pancake over as well. Consider a match in which both the performers are only interested in getting their material in, right? They're just trying to jam their stuff in and it doesn't really matter what the other person is trying to do. That selfish approach to making a match rarely, if ever, and quite possibly never results in an outstanding performance. And if you can't go out there and rise at least above average, at least above acceptable, you don't want to go out and just be serviceable on the card. You want to steal the show. You want to go out there and wow the crowd. And if you really want to get a match over in front of the audience, I do believe you have to be working to get your opponent over. And they must espouse the exact same approach to the work. They are there working, sweating, and bumping to get you over too. The second kernel of veteran wisdom I want to share with you today would have really benefit me about 19 or 20 years ago. It's this one. When you are traveling, Put all the gear you need for that night's match and any key props, like a championship title belt, in your carry-on bag when you're flying. Because if it's in your checked bag, you run the risk of the airline losing your bag. And that exact thing 
did happen to me once when I was wrestling in Mexico. I got down there only for the airline to have lost my luggage. And I had the most awful anxiety riddled 12, 16, 24 hours that followed thereafter trying to get the bag to catch up to me so that I had the championship title belt I needed to be wearing. And yes, most airlines are pretty responsible about making sure that bag eventually gets to you. Nevertheless, save yourself that hassle, save yourself the nightmare I endured, just put it all in your carry-on bag, even if it's a little bit bigger than you would like for it to be, and carry that thing on the plane with you. Do not check it. This third little gem is one I used to hear repeated practically every weekend during the 1990s, and then at some point during the OOs, it faded from the conversation. But how about we dust this old nugget off, shall we? It's this. If you're ever given the chance to speak on the microphone, you take it. Never refuse the opportunity to get your personality across to the audience, because it can help get you over faster, keep you over, or get you over at a higher level. The more the audience understands your persona, your in-ring character, the more likely they are to connect with it. And not everyone is always afforded the opportunity to speak on the microphone. As wrestlers, we're all given certain opportunities to get over. If we all have matches, then we all have ring entrances. We all get to present ourselves to the audience in that way. And even though matches can have differing run times, somebody might have seven minutes, someone else is booked on for nine, somebody else gets 15, and that isn't exactly equal, everyone does have a match in which to showcase their physical mechanics. But not everyone is given the opportunity to showcase their personality on the microphone. So if you're ever given the opportunity to speak on the mic, you take it. This next one is a crucial concept, so listen carefully. You need to understand the difference between a finish which is booked in pencil and a finish which is booked in ink. Do you know what I mean? The first time I heard that said aloud, I don't think I fully wrapped my head around it, but once I got it, it was a really valuable insight. And it took on new meaning to me when I became a booker, when it was up to me to decide the finishes of matches. The concept is essentially this. There are some finishes which are booked in pencil, so to speak, meaning that they aren't firm. They are open to being modified. And so a suggestion or a great idea could be taken into consideration by the booker or the creative team to impact exactly how the finish goes down. But there are also finishes booked in ink so to speak, meaning that they are firm for any number of reasons. It has to be this finish because we're trying to get this move over. It has to be this finish for contractual reasons. It has to be this finish because it helps us achieve a long-term goal. And these are not open to suggestion. Even if you imagine you have a superior idea, that is not going to be entertained by the booker or creative team. And worse, if you don't understand the difference, and you decide to go in and ask for a different finish or to suggest some modification you think would make it even better, that could be perceived as disrespect. It could even come off as insulting. So you've got to learn the difference between a finish which is booked in pencil and a finish which is booked in ink. And in order to do that, you need to pay careful attention to the verbiage that is used by the booker or the creative team. And only once you have a real handle on that and to a larger extent the culture around the locker room are you going to be able to distinguish that key difference. This next one is often attributed to classy Freddy Blassie. In fact, when I teach, I attribute it to him myself. But in preparation for today's video, I went looking to see if I could find a source on this, and I could not. But I'm gonna keep saying Freddy Blassie anyway. It's this. The only reason you should ever take the mic is to sell tickets. And here's what that adage means to me. If you are speaking on the microphone, you've got to be asking for some kind of investment from the audience. And there are different currencies. I think this is especially relevant during the social media era of wrestling. We're no longer in the carnival era. We're no longer in the territory era. 
We are no longer in the cable TV era either. We are now in the social media era of professional wrestling. And a real currency of this era is attention. It is valuable and finite in supply. And as far as I'm concerned, it is a currency just like dollars and cents, paper money. You want people to invest something. You are selling them on whatever is coming next. It's the pay-per-view that starts in a minute and a half. It's next week's rematch. It's the big event that's coming to town later on this month. But you are selling them on something. And whether they are spending their money, or they are spending their attention, or they're spending some other type of currency, the reason you are speaking to them is to sell them on whatever is next. This next one I think we should be teaching to all rookies during week one of training, and it's one I wish I had heard a whole lot sooner. When you are in a locker room, it's mouth shut, ears open. Take in everything you can. But when you are in the car, when you're riding somewhere with more experienced players, that is the time to network make connections, build rapport, and ask questions you need answers to. But these are two very different environments, and they're going to call on you to be able to learn in different ways. When you're in the locker room and it's time for mouths shut and ears open, you're going to soak in everything that you can. And then, maybe on the ride to the diner, maybe on the ride home, maybe while you're driving the veteran to their hotel room, you're going to call on their expertise and experience to help you parse what you absorbed in the locker room setting. For my money, these tidbits of veteran wisdom might occasionally need a little bit of updating for the era, but they are priceless. And I'm pleased to be able to share them with you. As promised, here's the video I did about always having a promo prepared. And making today's video reminded me of this video on the channel about six things I wish I had learned earlier on in my career. And I want to take this opportunity to just thank a couple of my great patrons who make all of this possible, like Nicholas, and Trey, and Brian. Thanks, guys.